The hundred watts incandescent light bulb in my kitchen finally died, so I thought it was time I replaced it with a nice shiny new low energy one. I bought six of these supposedly hundred watt equivalent LED lamps from eBay less than a year ago at a total cost of £16.99. That works at £2.83 each. All six have now died. So I've gone back to the good old incandescent bulb. The book says that the average life is 25,000 hours and it's good for 12,500 switch on cycles. Well, as I only switch the light on twice a day and for a total time of about two hours, that equates to almost 18 years. So, any one of these bulbs should have outlasted me. Every bulb failed in the same way. They ran incredibly hot, and for the first few hours they re smelt really strongly. The smell was a cross between burning Paxilin and TCP, and uh, some were sort of flickering right from the very start. Uh, that wasn't a good sign. Those that weren't flickering soon started to flicker and eventually died. They ended up very, very dim like this and very flickery. So I thought I'd have a look inside and uh, try and find out why they failed. It took me a long time to get the first one apart because I wasn't sure how they were constructed. So I went very carefully round it with a spudger to break the seal. Then I levered off the globe and it's all sort of covered in goo and I expected to find some switch mo gubbins or maybe a capacitive dropper but I found neither. I found this. So the most obvious thing is the 10 LED modules. You may just be able to make out the black dot in the middle of this one. Hang on it. Can you see the little black dot there? Because that's the blown one. Then there's a bridge rectifier. A constant current regulator device. A couple of chip resistors. Mains in comes here and there's another socket there which has clearly got something on the other side. Uh, it's marked plus and minus and the circuitry suggests that it's a capacitor. But how do you get to the other side? Now somebody put this thing together so I mean surely I should be able to get it apart if only I could find the correct sequence. Anyway, so I, I ended up sort of levering around at this, trying to get it apart. I caused a lot of damage in the process. I didn't want to use unreasonable force. You know, I, want, I wanted to try and repair this thing. So, so in the end, I, I sort of gave up and chucked it in the to-do pile and forgot about it. By the time the last bulb had failed, a few months later, I'd completely forgotten how to open them. That's the trouble with getting old. And this time I used the edge of a blister pack and I worked it round all the way round here, clearing out all the goo quite deep, as, as deep as I could go. And I got all that goo out. And then it, instead of levering it off I twisted it and and it came and it moved and I was quite surprised. All of these gubbins came out all in one go. It seems to have broken off the uh, the mains connectors, which is strange. I only gave it a quarter of a twist. I, you know, that's, well, why did it break off? You know, anyway, down in there, I could. Uh, 
I could make out that there's um, these are the mains wires, and I could make out there's a capacitor, but nothing else. It's just uh, completely empty. The plastic dome was still glued to the metalwork, so I just levered it off. And the, uh, there's the circuitry inside, just the same as all the others. So uh, that's the mystery thing inside that I couldn't get out of the other one. And uh, actually you can get in there and lever this out. In fact, I might do that. Um, there you go. It actually comes out. And there you have it. A little capacitor, 150, is that 150 or 130 degree? I can't read it with these glasses on. And it's a 400 volt, 6.8 microfarad capacitor. Slightly worrying, the mains wires come straight in to this socket. There's no, there's no current limiting at all. I'm very worried about that. Anyway, time for a circuit draw. Just, just straight. I'll just trace this out. Incidentally, these connectors are one way. And you can push them in easy enough, but you can't pull them out. They will not pull out. But I have found that if you twist it and pull at the same time, they will come out. Yeah. So they push in and they won't pull out. But if you twizzle and pull, you can screw it out. There must have been some advantage in um, having these sockets. Otherwise they wouldn't have gone to the effort of fitting them. So I reckon this the wires were fitted into the base of the plug. And this socket was, and this unit was fitted over the top. But it must have taken some dexterity to do that. I can't see any other way it was done, to be quite honest. Why would they waste a socket when they could have just attached some wires? There's got to be some reason for that socket. So I've traced the circuit of this device. And you can see the mains coming in on the left here. No protection at all. Bridge rectifier. 6.8 volt microfarad capacitor. Uh, 400 volt rated. 130 degrees centigrade rated. There's a 680k resistor to, uh, to ensure that there's no leakage through switch wiring and all the rest of it and that generates between 311 and 336 volts DC at that point. Um, it's 311 at 220 volts, 325 at 230 volts and 336 at 240 volts. So that's the sort of range that the thing is rated for. And then there are 10 LEDs. I haven't drawn all 10, but number one is um, is in that position and each lead drops 27.6 volts so the total for the entire string is 276 volts then you've got this reactor micro RM 9003B um, linear regulator thing with the 16 ohm resistor here to select the current through the thing and uh, there's, there's about 35 between 35 and 60 volts across that end and about 0.6 here now the current through the LEDs is determined by the 0.6 volt reference voltage of this thing and the 16 ohm resistor and you take the reference voltage divided by the resistance and you get a current of 37.5 milliamps through the LEDs, through the device, negligible current through this one. The power through each LED is 
27.6 volts, which is the, the drop across the lead, times 37.5 milliamps, which is the current through the lead. And that gives just over a watt per lead, which gives you a total of 10.35 watts for the entire chain. The power dissipated by the regulator is approximately 35 to 60 volts times the 37 milliamps. 35 to 60 volts is the voltage dropped across the regulator which at uh, 220 volts is that and at 240 volts is that. Anyway that gives you a power dissipation in the regulator of 1.31 to 2.25 watts. So the total power dissipated by this lamp is the 10.35 watts of the LEDs plus the dissipation of the regulator ignoring any dissipation in the um, in the bridge rectifier or anything else and that gives you a total of 11.66 to 12.6 watts which is not the 16 watts that the box says but things are a little bit more complicated actually um, this is an, a sort of an equivalent circuit where you've got the rectified mains coming in charging up the capacitor to 325 volts peak we'll assume 230 volts for this and there's a constant current flowing through the load of 35 milliamps 37.5 milliamps so the thing is how far does the voltage across the capacitor sag it charges up to the peaks it sags back down through the loads on the other half cycle so how far does it sag? Well, I'm no mathematician, so you may uh, take this with a pinch of salt, but um, the equation for a current through a capacitor is I equals C times dV over dt, where that is the rate of change of voltage per unit time. So if we rearrange that equation, we get dV over dt equals I over C. And we know that I is a constant 37.5 milliamps and C is 6.8 microfarads. So that gives us a rate of change dV by dt of 551 volts per second. Now this is a diagram of the voltage across the capacitor. Here's the rectified mains which goes between 0 and 325 volts and back to 0 and up to 325. Each one of these half cycles lasts 10 milliseconds. The capacitor charges up to the full mains voltage and then when the mains voltage drops below the capacitor voltage it's the capacitor sags back down at a rate of minus 551 volts per second it's constant it's a constant slope because it's a constant current and then when the mains comes back up to the voltage there it starts to charge again until it reaches the peak and then it sags back down. So you get this sort of sort of waveform. And it turns out by a little bit of but a bit of arithmetic that it drops to 279 volts. And the off time here is 59 and a half degrees. There's 59 and a half degrees of the waveform where there's no current flowing. Then the current flows into the capacitor for 30.5 degrees and then it stops flowing for the rest of this time. So 30.5 degrees is only 1.666 milliseconds. So the, the current flows into the capacitor in these 
sort of like square tooth um, waveforms. This is the current into the capacitor, the blue, the blue waveform. Which it's a very spiky sort of, it's a very um, pulsy sort of waveform. Hence the uh, the poor power factor of the thing. But it means that the total voltage across the LEDs never drops below 279 volts and they require 276 volts so they don't flicker. They've always got a constant voltage across them and a constant current through them. And the regulator drops the rest. The regulator drops between the 276 and the 279. So it's 3 volts at the bottom of the waveform and 50 volts at the top of the waveform and that keeps the current constant. So that capacitor, that 6.8 microfarad capacitor was chosen very carefully to make sure it does this. It could have been bigger in which case there would have been less sag but then it would have cost more. Now I've heard it said that it's perfectly fine to bridge out the faulty lead because the regulator chip will just keep the current constant through the rest of the leads and they won't pop and that's fine it does work I've done it on this lamp and proved that it does work the problem is that now you've got a 9 watt lamp and the extra power that would have gone through that lead is now going through the regulator so the lamp is still taking around about 12 watts but it's only giving 9 watts worth of light output so it's less efficient it's getting warmer there's more voltage across that chip and more current no same current more voltage more wattage being dissipated by that chip now eventually that might drive that chip into thermal overload there's a I haven't mentioned it before but there's a thermal overload protection in that chip when the chip reaches 130 degrees centigrade it stops it the current ramps right down and that reduces the uh, dissipation and obviously when the current goes down the voltage across the chip goes up um, but it works to protect the chip um, from excessive temperature the chip itself is bonded to this aluminium substrate so if the whole thing gets to 130 degrees even if the chip isn't dissipating the power if all of this is dissipating the power and that gets to 130 degrees that will limit the current through the chip anyway i think these things are overrun so i'm going to be changing that resistor down to a smaller to a bigger value to try and get um, less current there has to be a diminishing returns of current versus light output for these chips these LEDs so I think that I can probably find a, a value for a resistor for that that gives me a reasonable light output without overheating and overdriving all of these chips I hadn't got a 27 ohm resistor, which I think would have been a better value, or maybe even a 22, but I got a 33, I got loads of 33s, so I stuck a 33 in across these tabs. And now it takes half the current, and it takes 5 watts, still the same power factor, and um, it seems to give a reasonable light output. Now the camera will uh, overload when I do this, but this is this is the light from that lamp, and I'll go up to the actual lamp itself, and it it overloads, but uh, you can see there's plenty of light. And this is an 18 watt um, compact fluorescent by comparison. But you can see it does flicker. I have two main niggles about these lamps. Firstly, that they're overrun. I think that there are too few LEDs um, with too much current flowing through them. 
And the second one is that there is no no fusible link or limiting resistor or anything. Um, you just got the rectifier straight across the mains. So the most likely scenario is that the bulb will burn out and uh, and be thrown away before anything goes wrong. But what if the capacitor goes short circuit, or the rect rectifier goes short circuit? If you're lucky, if there's low resistance in your lighting circuit, it will blow the fuse straight away, no problem. But if you've got joints in the lighting circuit, some of the, you know, these screw jointy things, or the screw terminals at the light switch, or the contacts on the light switch itself might be a bit dirty. You've got screw terminals on the light fitting, and you've got the rather poor contact between the pins on the bottom of the bulb and the light fitting. Any of these joints could have significant resistance, and the short circuited rectifier could put a lot of current through here, up to 5 amps. Let's say it was 4.99 amps, or let's say it's 5 amps. That fuse isn't going to go straight away. There's going to be a lot of heat generated at whichever joint is 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 um as high resistance, and that's a lot of a lot of watts dissipated, and I think that could start a fire. So I, I really don't trust these lamps at all. Now the remaining mystery for me is how these things are put together. You've got to get those wires into those holes, or into these end caps. Oh, they've gone away now. But it turns out, if you look at these, um, they've got little ridges and on there you probably can't see, but there are little ridges in there. So these have been pushed in. It turns out that the, ma the ridges on the wire match the ridge pattern on this base, on this pin. So it looks to me like this this was pushed into there and lined up with the holes and then the pins were pushed in trapping the cables. But I have tried and tried, I've fiddled about with this and I've tried to line them up and I can't get those wires to come out of those holes. So I don't know how it's done. But also it's crimped here. And I don't know whether um, it could be done the other way around. It could be that the wires are crimped in there. And then this is offered up and the wires pushed into that socket. But even that's difficult. So uh, I'm at a bit of a loss as to know. I've, I've taken these out. I was trying to get the base out to get it apart. Um, but yeah, this is um, this is a mystery. How these cunning Chinese put these things together is it amazes me. Anyway, I'll shut up now. If you enjoyed this video, if you lasted this long, if you managed to stay asleep, give me a thumbs up if you liked it, or give me a thumbs down if you didn't like it, and tell me why not in the comments below. Bye!